Hi, everyone. Welcome to week two, class four of data journalism. Uh, we are on YouTube today, and your link to your YouTube uh, uh, video will be uh, right here on our class schedule here. Uh, we're uh, actually down lower on the page. There's Tuesday, September 3rd here. Thursday, September 5th, today's lecture uh, is right here. Um, and uh, these are also linked off of the syllabus schedule as well. Um, just a little reminder before we get started here, next Tuesday's class meets in SEO 1200. That's our Tuesday, September 10th class. So uh, we'll be back in person next week uh, once I uh, return uh, from my training trip. Um, our homework, um, chapters one and three in Data Plus Journalism textbook. Um, uh, it really sets up everything we do in week three with Digging for Data. Um, make sure you look through the Digging for Data handout in week three of uh, the Google Drive folder. Um, and then also, uh, there's uh, it says three short chapters. It's actually two uh, short chapters uh, from the Data Journalism Handbook that also prepare you well for next week. Uh, the five-minute guide to getting data and your right to data as well, public records. Um, so that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to pull data sets uh, off the web and, and uh, figure out where to find them. Not just local data sets here in Chicago, but statewide, national, and international as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, today, let's start out with uh, setting up free AI accounts. So go ahead and click on this little Google Doc link here. It will take you to this page. Um, and you can hit pause if you want to uh, and take the time to do this. We're going to set up uh, free accounts on all of these uh, AI tools. We're going to use them throughout the semester. Um, you don't have to set up Midjourney. Midjourney costs ten bucks a month, but uh, do the free version of ChatGPT, Claude, Google Gemini, Perplexity AI, which is a really cool tool because it's not only a large language model. Uh, that you can ask questions of. It also goes out on the internet and pulls in information. Microsoft Copilot. Um, uh, I think your Microsoft uh, credential logins uh, that uh, you use at the university might work. Um, if not, you can skip it. Uh, it's not the end of the world because you've got other four other really good ones. And also set up a free account at Julius.ai, uh, which is uh, built for uh, data journalists. So we're going to use that one quite a bit. It does a lot of really, really cool things. and saves you a lot of time. Um, uh, you can also add Julius as a browser extension in the Google Chrome store. I've got the link down here. It'll actually drop Julius uh, a little button in the upper right hand corner of your Google Sheets, uh, and uh, it'll enable you to uh, use uh, uh, Julius within that uh, spreadsheet. So uh, it'll uh, you'll be able to use it on a number of different things. And here it is, analyze with Julius. And I can, uh, if I had data in this, I could go through and start asking it questions, which is really cool. Google's starting to add this in uh, to Google Docs, but Julius will do it with Word, you know, just about anything, uh, as long as it's up uh, on, on Google Drive or, or uh, in a Google Sheet. Um, really cool. Uh, and that's optional. You, you don't have to use the Julius browser extension, but it's pretty handy. So on your home computer or your laptop at home or your laptop computer, if you're bringing one to class, uh, put it on there. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, we don't have Julius installed on the computers in, in SEO 1200. Uh, they're way behind. Um, so uh, they would never uh, probably allow us to download something like that. But it's perfectly safe. It comes from the Chrome store. And just make sure you have the logins to all four of your, uh, uh, five of your accounts here, if you can get them, as well as Julius. So there's six things you need to set up. Uh, you can do them after the lecture. You can hit pause right now. I uh, go ahead and set them all up so you're ready for next week. It's one of our big homework assignments for this week. All right, so by now, uh, you're probably done setting up your uh, AI accounts. Um, if not, you know, just do them after uh, you're done watching the video. Um, I wanted to show you Twitter threads. I talked about them in our last lecture, how a data diary can translate into a good Twitter thread. A Twitter thread is a series of stacked tweets. The first tweet typically is a link to your story, and then uh, the subtweets uh, are uh, little tweets that explain, you know, how you reported the story how you went out and researched it, how you uh, analyzed the data, where you found it, uh, how you visualized it, and so on. It's typically five to six tweets maximum. Some of these you'll see in here are a little longer, but you know, most students do about five to six tweets. It's typically something that you'll do not with your weekly projects, but only with your final project. It's required for the final project, and we'll go over that in a few weeks. Um, but uh, the final project, uh, the last thing you'll do typically is write that Twitter thread. So go ahead and click on this little link here, and we'll open this up. 
And I've got dozens of different types of Twitter threads in here. Some of these are off of breaking news stories, but a lot of them are off of big project stories like Tulsa's Black Wall Street, uh, this uh, project uh, that ProPublica did on the U.S.-Mexico border operations. Uh, the one I'm going to look at is this one uh, right at the top uh, here that Mary Jo Webster of the Minneapolis Star Tribune did. So if you click on this link, she explains how she worked on this year-long data project in Minneapolis for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. It's called uh, Denied Justice. Um, she actually got it wrong up here. She called it Justice Denied. It's actually Denied Justice. Um, even the pros make mistakes. And it has a link to their overall project that they spent a month uh, doing. This was actually produced a couple years before uh, George Floyd happened. So it shows you some of the flaws in the Minneapolis Police Department beyond just, uh, you know, the horrible thing they did to George Floyd. They've had issues up there for years, a lot of homicides, too. I've had some friends that have reported on, on this for years. So Mary Jo just kind of gives an overview of here's our project and here's, you know, a quote uh, from one of the victims and and she was talking about it, um, and she had agreed to go on the record and, and have them use her face, which I thought was was very interesting. You know, uh, usually uh, they ask that their face is blurred out, but she didn't. Um, it's uh, you know a lot of the, she outlines a lot of the failings in law enforcement. It's a lot of data how they failed to interview witnesses, collect evidence. You know, just a lot of bad stuff. So she just gives you the overview and the link to the project here. But here's where it gets interesting. She did it in steps. You don't have to do it this way, but a lot of a lot of people like to do it. Steps two, three, and four, where the idea came from, what questions they wanted to answer, what their hypothesis was, um, and then kind of how the the process works. You know, with police, um, uh, with the Minneapolis police reporting things. Um, public records laws and how they work and how they uh, are able to access those. She talked about that, how they interviewed experts on the story. And she actually has a link to a little story about how they reported and, and wrote the story. Um, oh, hey, we ran the PDFs through optical character recognition. I'm going to show you how to use that this semester. They used Airtable for uh, data entry and they used these other tools, uh, how they analyze data. They used a tool called R for that. We don't use that here, but it's pretty cool. Their methodology and then you know just some other things about hers is really long it's like 14 or 15 steps but yours will be about five or six so you know as you're reporting your final project keep that data diary uh pretty much when you write the data diary it's cut and paste you're just gonna you know kind of flush out uh each step uh for your uh uh, uh twitter thread so and you just what you do is you just keep replying to these it'll say add post add post you'll just keep hitting that uh, and you'll create your uh, Twitter thread. Pretty cool. You can read some others in here. Uh, there's a great one, Heather Sharoni, who's a former student of mine, uh, covers City Hall at WTTW here in Chicago, um, uh, which is a PBS station here. Uh, ProPublica has done several really good ones, uh, a bunch of them in here. If you're a big sports person, you've got uh, uh, Jack Silverstein, who, who uh, did a great Twitter thread on an old Bulls series with the Knicks. Some really good stuff in here. So, uh, you know, uh, read through these and kind of get a feel for how these different reporters write these Twitter threads. Um, and then you'll be doing it for your final project as well. Okay, we've got too many lectures for you today. I told you this would be a quick, quicker class. Form versus function uh, and how to scale a chart. Uh, and also how to look at data a little bit differently. Some of the flaws in data and how to look at it a little bit differently. So these are two very short slideshows. And I'll start the first one. Form versus function in data biz, okay? They're two different things. Function is the data that you get. That's the conveying the information, sorting and filtering the data. That's the function. The form is the graphical form format that the data takes when you take and load that data into a mapping software or move it into a chart making tool. That's the form, okay? The form is the graphic. The function is the actual data set behind it that's making it run, that's, that's helping you visualize the information. Uh, Alberto Cairo, who uh, teaches at the University of Miami in Miami, Florida, um, uh, talks about how function actually limits the form. Uh, if your data is very limited, you can only do so much with the graphic, kind of data in, data out. You know, data in is the data going into the software, data out is the form that it takes. So if there's flaws in the data, missing data, poorly formatted data, you're going to get a poor form or a poor graphic. 
It's called garbage in, garbage out. It's a term we've used in data journalism for years, okay? Uh, Alberto raises this question. Da data, the questions that the designer means to for the reader to ponder, dictate the form. So the data dictates the form, okay? Or at least the very at least constrain it to a limited set of choices. I'm only going to do Chicago homicides for the past five years as opposed to the last ten. So the data I put in is just for the last five years. Okay, so that's that. That's what he's talking about there. It's, it, it limits the form. You know, so we don't have an infinite charter graphic. Um, data storytelling, which is what we do in here, is a little bit of art and a little bit of science. Um, the spreadsheets and things that we're going to work with in the next couple of weeks are the science of it, okay? The art is the physical form that it takes when we build the graphics or the maps. So where the two kind of cross over in this Venn diagram, I told you we don't use Venn diagrams an awful lot, but we do here. That's where the data storytelling is. This is what you'll be doing on your weekly assignments and your final project, is you'll be doing the science of sorting and filtering the data, creating the art with it, and then providing the context with a short story that accompanies that chart. Okay. Um, we typically do this with Legos. Uh, I get, actually give you guys a set of Legos if we were meeting in person this time. Uh, and we actually build uh, 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 little uh, charts using uh, data and Legos. Um, and I uh, come around and see if you put a header and footer on it. My cute little nephew here is not so cute anymore. He's 16. Um, yeah, he's the one who loans us the Legos, you know, and so it's his warning, don't eat my Legos or steal them or step on them. Um, but we're not doing that exercise because we're not meeting in person. It's kind of a silly assignment, but students learn a lot from it as far as scaling a chart uh, and knowing what each block and each color of the, the little Legos represent. Uh, and we're going to get that experience when we build it with uh, uh, the software as well. So, you know, really, it's not something that you absolutely have to have. Looking at data differently. This is an interesting one. I do this one a lot with my professional newsroom trainings. Um, and it goes back, it's a little history lesson going back to World War II. For those of you that are fans of the Top Gun movies, we think about the, the latest movie, Top Gun Maverick, that came out uh, a year ago, summer. Um, what was the mission in Top Gun Maverick? It was to blow up the plutonium plants buried in the mountains. And that was the Navy's mission. But Maverick here, Tom Cruise, had a second mission to get the pilots home safely. Because basically the Navy was sending them off on a suicide mission uh, because they didn't value human pilots. They're shifting to drones. But what Maverick was saying was like, wait a minute, we can do both. We can fly this mission and get home safely uh, yeah, with minimal uh, yeah, injuries and, and loss of, of equipment. Um, so, the, you know, the latter has always been a challenge in real life battles. Uh, going back to World War II, I'm a big fan of, you know, World War II history and watch all the documentaries and read on as much as I can. Um, and one of the things I learned by reading these books uh, was looking at World War II and how they studied data in airplanes that returned from battle. Um, there's an Apple TV series out right now. It's got Austin Butler in it, the, the big movie star. Um, and Steven Spielberg produced it. And, and you always see the planes come in and land from their battles in Germany or over France. Uh, and the planes were all shot up. Well, they actually had data scientists come in and look at those and engineers and study where those bullet holes were. And then they would use that to reinforce certain parts of the planes. Okay, so if a plane came back and, you know, they saw it all shot up on the wings and, you know, in here in the kind of the main fuselage and on the, on the, uh, uh, on the tail, you know, well, we better reinforce those areas, right? You know, because that's where the, the Germans or, you know, in, in, in the East, you know, uh, the Japanese pilots were targeting the planes. But one of the engineers kind of saw this differently. He was actually a mathematician by, by trade, but also did engineering work. And his theory on this was, wait a minute, these planes are coming back all shot up in these areas so they can still fly. What if we looked at the planes that were actually had crashed and had been shot down? Because we're looking at a limited set of data, like I was talking about earlier, the, the function, limited set of da data. So the guy's named Abraham Wall. This is a photo of him. He was a Hungarian mathematician. He pointed out that the reason certain planes weren't covered in bullet holes uh, in certain areas was that they never returned. So obviously, those planes that are being shot down were shot in a different area than the planes that were able to return. If your tail's shot up, you can fly. If your wings are shot up, they can fly. But what about if your engines were all shot up or the cockpit was all shot up? Could you return then if the pilot was pilots were dead? 
uh, and the engines wouldn't work? Hmm. That was his question that he raised. He goes, reinforce the planes in areas where there weren't any bullet holes. Here's what they found when they were studying planes that didn't come back. That the German and Japanese pilots and the tail gunners were actually targeting the Allied planes in the engines, kind of up here around the uh, 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 cockpit, too. Because, you know, if the pilot's dead, there's nobody to fly the plane. If the engines aren't moving the plane forward, where's the plane going to go? It's a big hunk of metal. It's going to steal. It's going to go straight down. So they realized Wald knew to look for the missing data, not just what sat in front of him. This is what sat in front of him. It's the planes that returned. He goes, let's start looking out in the field. So they actually took some engineers out in the field and saw the planes that had been shot down. You know, some of them made it back partway, you know, so they weren't behind enemy lines. And they were seeing that the engines were all shot up and the cockpits were all shot. So remember, sometimes the story it can be behind the data. Uh, story behind the data is arguably more important than the data itself. Okay, so sometimes, you know, maybe you're looking for a certain topic and there is no data available on it. Uh, there's no government agency tracking it or nonprofit tracking it. Well, maybe that's your story. You know, there is no data on this. You know, go and ask, interview people why there's no missing data on this. Whoever that is in charge of that government office, why aren't we tracking this data? You know, where is it? <laughs> you know, are you, are you using it, not releasing it to us? It, it, does it not exist at all? And why doesn't it exist? Um, so are the missing pieces more important than what's in front of us? And that's what Alexander Wald taught us. And I picked that up, you know, just from reading uh, a, a book about World War II. And I thought it was really cool because it applies to data science. You know, don't always look at what's right in front of you, what we download off the city of Chicago data portal, what's not available to us, okay? Kind of a cool little uh, uh, story there and, and a little spin on data journalism. You know, we can learn from history a lot of times, you know, and, and not, not to repeat history. That's what Wald was trying to do is don't repeat history. Let's reinforce our planes around the engines to make them safer. Then we'll have more planes returning. And they did. And it helped turn the war because um, our air support was much stronger after they did that. All right. Just a reminder, make sure you do your homework here. Uh, anything from the previous uh, uh, lecture two from Tuesday, uh, be sure to read that article in our world and data. It's very important. The Data Journalism Best Practices PDF will be helpful too. Uh, and everything, these chapters to read here, these two short chapters and chapters one and three in, in the Data Plus Journalism uh, Handbook and the Digging for Data Handout in week three, all set up next week. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll do a lot better on the assignment next week uh, if you've done that reading and you'll uh, have uh, the context. So that's all I had for you. I told you it'd be a shorter lecture. Uh, make sure you get the homework done. And we'll see you next week in SEO 1200. Thanks for doing the YouTube lectures with me. Uh, while well, this uh, travel week uh, was uh, had me uh, uh, off the mainland. We'll see you. Aloha.